Okay, so uh, welcome to the session on Octopus, um, which is a new publishing platform for scholarly research. I'm Hannah Crago, I'm the Open Research Development Librarian at the University of Essex, and I'm pleased to introduce today Tim Fellows, Octopus Product Development Manager for JISC. I don't think there's meant to be a development in there, is there? Sorry, Tim. No, um, part of the job. We're still developing. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Alex Freeman, um, Executive Director at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge and the creator and lead for Octopus. So Tim and Alex are going to be talking to us today about how Octopus can play a key part in opening up research culture. So thank you for joining us today, Tim and Alex. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and whenever you're ready, um, take it away. Thank you so much. Right, I'm going to try and share my screen, which for those of you who joined a little bit early will know is a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, just not because I'm totally incompetent, but because Teams is playing up for me today. Uh, so uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully this will share the right screen for you this time. Um, Tim, can, you, can you give me a shout? Is that ready? Is that working? Yeah, that looks good to me. Oh. Perfect. Right. Um, yes, so welcome on a, a, for me, wet Friday afternoon. Um, as Hannah said, um, I come from the University of Cambridge, but my background before that was uh, in the media as a documentary maker. And so I came back to academia uh, towards the end of 2016. And when I did, I was really surprised at the research culture that I found myself in, not because it was a bad research culture in Cambridge or in my team specifically, but because of the pressures that people um, are under caused by the publication system. And so um, I started thinking about what was causing all of these different problems that people were very unhappy about. And all of that led me to come up with the idea of Octopus. And I'm going to talk about the philosophy of Octopus and what's behind it as much as about the structure of it. And then Tim will show you how it actually works in practice. Um, but yesterday we launched a report which was based on some research that the University of Bristol have done alongside us which was looking at the research culture and um, surveying people and interviewing people about how they feel about the research culture and about barriers to publishing in different ways. And so I've now got some uh, snapshots from that snapshot uh, to share with you as well. And so one of the things that really stood out to me in that research was the fact that almost everyone that um, the researchers talked to said that they wanted to be able to share work earlier so that they could get constructive feedback on it rather than sort of working in a vacuum and then submitting to a journal where they get peer review which is rather of an antagonistic and gatekeeping role because by the time you're submitting a paper you don't really want any uh, feedback you just want to get it out there because you've done it all and then another thing which really stands out to me is that at the moment we don't have any good guides when it comes to research assessment. So when we talk to people about what they're being assessed on, it's very much about the publication record and that doesn't tell you how good the work is behind it. And we all know about problems of reproducibility and questionable research practices. Um, and we know that they're an issue within the system. And the one that really stands out to me about this is how can we reward researchers for doing best practice? Um, and you can see from these quotes that it's really quite um, it's really quite depressing that people feel that they need to, in quotes, cheat in order to get ahead, that there isn't a kind of level meritocratic playing field for researchers. And that people are really, really time pressured, which is understandable, but that means that you don't get, uh, you have to put your resources into what is going to get you funding and what's going to get you promotion and what gets you funding and promotion is not 
the best practice. It's not sharing things openly. It's not developing software and code that's going to help other people. It's not sharing data sets. And so one of these big problems is the fact that so much is concentrated around the publication system. And that's what really hit me straight on when I came back to academia, because I'd been working in the media where, of course, it's all about the communication. That is your job is to do that, getting stuff out there. And you're judged entirely on what you get out there because you are a journalist or a documentary maker or whatever. But as a researcher, that's not your job. Your job is to do the work and the communication of it is a secondary role. It shouldn't be the only thing or the major thing that you're being um, assessed on. Um, and you can see again from some of these quotes that people feel that um, they have to get their names on papers. It doesn't matter so much what you're doing. It matters that you get your name on a paper and that where you publish those papers is you know, critically, critically important to how they are uh, and how that work is then assessed. And when we ask people how much they thought different factors influenced the assessment of research, you can see that publication record, and you're probably not surprised, is right up there along with trendiness and novelty. Rigor of methods comes below all of that, and open research practices comes right down at the bottom, which is, I feel, a bit depressing. So given that researchers are, we're all under pressure to publish journal articles, I think it's uh, interesting to look at what's important in a journal, journal article. So you look at, for instance, this is from one of the key um, top science journals, their guide for authors is telling people how to maximise impact by getting across a focused message and trying to maximise readership impact citations. It's not a surprise, you're used to reading these kinds of uh, author guides. But what it means is that the, the kind of writing that you're being encouraged to do is about uh, writing the sorts of things that I did in the media. It's about writing streamlined narratives, it's around getting your point across, it's about changing people's minds and changing people's opinions. But good research and good stories that people want to read are two very different things. And I think one of the biggest problems with the current system, or perhaps the key problem at the root of everything in this current system, is that journals are trying to do these two kinds of jobs at once. So on the one hand, They've got a really important role of disseminating findings to people who can be influenced by those findings, people who might change their practice or change the way that they think about the world. But on the other hand, journals are sort of being forced to fulfil another job, which is a rather thankless task of being a kind of patent office, somewhere where researchers establish priority for everything they do, place to record full details of methods and data, being that absolute record. And that's a really specialised role. If you're trying to make something readable, you don't want to describe full detail. You don't want to put in things that didn't work. You don't want to put in all the extra analyses that you did to check robustness or protocols that haven't been carried out yet, or even limitations and uncertainties. But those should all be in the primary research record. And they so they, they take two different kinds of writing, really. And because the primary research record is the main record of what researchers get judged on, bending the incentive structure towards the dissemination role of journals, which naturally happens because dissemination is what drives the readership and hence the sales of journals, bends the incentive structure of the second. So that's why we lose things out of the primary research record that we really need to have there. So I think the answer is to split these two jobs. And that's what Octopus is designed to do. It's designed to be a primary research record so that it sits alongside journals. It's not there to replace journals, it sits alongside journals. So journals can carry on disseminating relevant findings to audiences who want these concise, easy to read narratives, which is really important 
and has commercial potential, so I have no problem with journals carrying on charging subscription fees to its readers. But alongside that, I think we need to have another system that acts as that research record, which has a different aim, different audiences, different function, and is a place full of official recording, assessment, and quality checking of research based on the full details, because you can't check and assess the quality if you don't have all of those full details, if you don't have the code, the data, the failures, the blind alleys, all of those need to be recorded for posterity. So Octopus is designed to work with all of the data repositories, the code repositories, the protocols and ideas, pre-registration sites that are already existing and growing up, but it pulls them all together. Um, and does it in such a way that I hope it can reset the incentive structure so that we as researchers are being rewarded for doing what the world needs us to do. So Octopus is designed then to maximise the access to primary research, so it's free to read, obviously, and it's also free to write. It's funded by um, the Research England, so the government funder for research, um, so it's a public service. But it's designed not just to have all of those useful tools like automatic language translation so that people can read and write in their own native language, but to have a very different structure in order to incentivize all the best practice um, guidelines that have grown up around research over the last decades. And I think the key to that is breaking up the concept of a paper as the main unit of publication. Now that's because the research process naturally comes in a series of steps, which tend to be done one after the other. They can be done you know, in cycles, obviously, it's an iterative process, but each of these different steps requires quite different skills and different resources. So you have specialists increasingly who are protocol designers, who are data collectors, who are analysts in, in um, specialist um, qualitative or quantitative analysts. And the system of creating a paper that describes everything that is done just doesn't fit with the modern research process. You're forcing people to get to the end of a process that involves lots of different people, not sharing any of it until you've got to the end, and then trying to tell this nice, neat narrative story line through it. And that drives all sorts of um, bad practices. You know, the, the worrying about scooping, so keeping your head down and keeping everything secret for years until you've published the paper. Um, tr wanting your interpretation to uh, be a positive, you know, to get positive results that's going to be persuasive, that's going to support a hypothesis. So all of the questionable research practices like p-hacking and hypothesizing after the research, after the results are known, all of those are encouraged by the need to try and tell a story and to try and sell a story. But Octopus, because we can be the primary research record, we're not worried about selling stories, has a structure which can much more closely match what's naturally done and by whom. So each of these boxes is represents a publication, a full publication in its own right. So you can have a publication that is just a protocol or just an analysis, just an interpretation. They can all be written by different people. And it's a many to one and one to many relationship. So you can have meta analyses that bring together lots of different data sets and analyze them. Or you can have a protocol that's got lots of different data sets that have been collected by different people according to that same protocol. All of these are really you know, best practice and really useful in the literature. So we need these things in the record. And this system is designed to not only facilitate that, but encourage it. And so if you're um, familiar with registered reports where you submit to a journal at the point of having designed a protocol, it's a bit like taking that concept to the extreme. So a registered report would be the first three sections, uh, first three publication layers in Octopus bundled together, followed by the next four. Um, but you'll notice that all of these are linked to each other. 
So it's not like one of the uh, sort of repositories, a bit like F1000, if you know that um, site, where you can publish small these sorts of small units, but you just throw them into this big soup. In Octopus, they're all linked to each other, which means that you never come across data that doesn't have the protocol to which it was uh, collected linked above it. You know where that protocol comes from, what it's trying to do, because it's linked to the hypothesis or the theoretical rationale above that. And that's linked to the research problem. So all of these things that have to be linked to each other in this branching structure. And of course, some of you will have realized that there are seven types of publication on the screen, and yet Octopus implies eight. And the eighth type of publication is a peer review. So reviews can be published attached to any other kind of publication in Octopus, and they're treated and valued in the same way as other publications, because reviewing is a research skill like any other, and we need to incentivize it and to encourage good reviewing. But there are also advantages to all of these different design features. They're there for a reason, and it looks different from paper publication for lots of different reasons. So first of all, trying to uh, get away from the problems that um, you get from the delays in publication. So in Octopus, there's no gatekeepers, there's no journal editors, there's no peer review before publication. As soon as you and your co-authors are happy, you can press publish. And Tim's going to demonstrate that in a bit. Um, and so you can see from these quotes from the research that um, the University of Bristol did that this is a popular thing, you know, even if I uh, announce my hypothesis, but I never get around to testing it, if somebody else does, that's totally fine, because you've timestamped that hypothesis, and you can get much um, more stuff out in the open. Uh, so you get priority, you don't have to worry about scooping. If somebody else then proves your hypothesis, I hate the term proves, but if the uh, collect data and your hypothesis ends up being very popular, it's your hypothesis, you've got your name on it. Um, but of course, as the other quote says, institutions must be reformed to recognise these uh, forms of publishing research. So yes, we've got work to do. Of course, because you're publishing in smaller units, you've also got smaller author groups. Um, and that is important, especially for making sure that everybody gets recognition, but especially specialists, um, because at the moment, there isn't really an advantage to becoming a really good specialist, say a, a statistician or a, a real uh, protocol designer, because you end up with middle authorship on papers. And we all know, even though it shouldn't, even though there are things like the credit taxonomy of who did what, that these, uh, these author lists don't give full recognition to who did what. Whilst we may need to make sure that people can specialise because specialisation and professionalisation ends up in having better work being done. So it's accountable and it's meritocratic. And as I've said several times, there's no need to tell a story because so many people feel like pressure to try and tell a story. And, you know, we in our survey, we found that of people who hadn't published research, a third of them hadn't published it because they couldn't find a nice, neat story through it, which is really depressing. And it also leads to work not getting out there. So we've all got these file draw ideas and data sets that aren't getting published because they don't fit into a nice story that can be sold to a journal. And overall, one of the key things about Octopus is to try to move away from the emphasis being on the findings and the implications of those findings. Because as I've said, that's part of the narrative drive. That's part of what journal articles are trying to do. But it's, it's important, and that's why people are worried about scooping, because so much emphasis is put on the findings that until you get to that point, you don't want anybody else to beat you to it. But if we make sure that it's just as important to be doing robust defining of research problems, robust theory work, robust analysis work, then we're putting a much more equal emphasis, we're encouraging specialisation, and it changes the way 
that research gets done and research gets assessed to make sure it's all robust. And it changes that culture of secrecy into one where you really want to share your work because you're in a collaborative environment. You're doing your bit, other people are doing their bit. It's not about trying to get towards the findings. Now, I mentioned uh, peer review and the different way that um, Octopus does peer review. And there are several journals already doing uh, post-publication peer review and open peer review. But the fact that we have these small units of publication means that peer review is a little bit different. As that quote up at the top says, should be grunts assessing grunts. So you need the analysts to be assessing the analysis. It's so often, as we all know, that papers go through peer review, but they haven't really had a specialist looking at the specialist bits. You've got two or three peer reviewers, but who was looking at the analysis? Who was looking at the methods? Who was looking at how the data was collected? Who was looking at the ethics? All of these different aspects need specialism, uh, specialist views on them. And with these smaller units of publication, we can get more specialist peer review on each of the different bits. But it also changes the, the way we feel about peer review. As I've already said, it's not now a gatekeeping role, it's a much more constructive role. So if a peer reviewer makes a suggestion, you can reversion your work, perhaps even offer them um, co-authorship on the reversion version. Um, and it's a way of changing what peer review really means. And again, working towards this more collaborative uh, approach. And part of that is recognising that reviewing is a skill like any other. Of course, occasionally you need something a bit deeper than a peer review. You need to be able to raise an immediate concern about a publication, especially because we've got no barriers to publication. So researchers can be publishing anything. And that might raise some issues of plagiarism or uh, copyright violation, all of these things that might get picked up during um, a traditional editorial process. We have a red flagging system. So if you as a, a reader spot something that is a concern, then you can raise a red flag to other readers. So they immediately, the red flag raises, they know that there's a concern, they can read what your concern is, and the authors get emailed about it. And hopefully it can all be resolved quite quickly by a reversion. If not, it can be escalated to Research Integrity Office. So overall then, fundamentally, what I really hope this all does is to help change the research culture and the way that we approach research and the way we approach our careers. Um, it's looking at the intrinsic quality of research itself and allowing that to come through, changing the way we think about our place within the research environment. So instead of being individuals working within a, a tight group of collaborators trying to build our tall towers and put a flag on the top and say we've got this high impact publication, we've done this study, it's about thinking I'm a specialist, this is what I'm good at, I'm going to do this work to the very best of my ability, this is my brick within the, the structure as it were. The neighbouring brick might be somebody I've never met who works in another country with another set of experience, maybe even at another time. They could be working 10 years in the future. But we're all putting our robust bricks together and the height, the impactful findings are like an emergent property from this. We're all collaborating together worldwide. And so I really hope that, you know, this is a a real change in the way that research is done. And I've mentioned, you know, this, this concern about um, why people might have not shared their research plans, their research protocols, their ideas. And that fear of being scooped is huge. I know it. But moving away from findings being the be all and end all is something that will help that. Then we've got people not knowing where to publish, finding that it's no benefit to their career, that their work doesn't have enough impact to get it published. They don't know how to share. They don't know how to write it up. So all of those things are things that Octopus is hoping to tackle. 
They don't expect to use for feedback. Well, hopefully that will actually change as people, this system takes off. And the fear of being wrong, well, that's something we can't necessarily change. But hopefully with the change of the culture and the expectation that you can reversion if you make a mistake, that will also change. So hopefully we're tackling all of these major barriers. So to finish up then, what's in it for you as a researcher, if you want, if you feel like Octopus is a great project, you can see why it would be an advantage to everybody in the long run. Why is it an advantage to you now to do it? Well, it's, uh, it's free, it's easy to write a publication, it's relatively quick to write a publication, it's not like writing a paper. It means that you get that instant priority. So once it's out there, you get your own DOI, you can cite it, and as Tim will show you, you get a CV on your page, which your institution can see, seeing what you've published, both inside Octopus and outside. And hopefully you can get rid of, or can get credit for all of those file draw data sets and ideas and things that you wouldn't publish anywhere else and you can get credit for them, it's meritocratic. For journals, you might think this, this uh, is a challenge to them, but actually journals are very much on board with this. We've spoken to several who, and Royal Society Open Science is now a full partner of Octopus. They can see that it's almost like having a well-organized supplementary information. It takes the pressure off them to have stuff that they don't want in their journals, all the data, all the code, but they can see how useful it is. It needs to be somewhere. So we work alongside journals. I won't go into the advantages for funders, but obviously we're thinking about how this can change the funding system and talking to funders because we recognize that where funders go, researchers follow. And the same is true of institutions. So um, again, Tim will show you in a second that there are it's much easier for uh, institutions now to be able to see within Octopus everything that each individual researcher has done. So you can show off in order to get your promotion, get your hiring. And things that you do within Octopus get channeled to your institutional repositories as well. So we're integrating with all the institutional systems that we can to make that a seamless process. Right, at this point, I'm going to stop presenting, stop sharing my screen and hand over to Tim to show you how this works in practice. Thank you very much, Alex. And I will just drop a link uh, in the chat to uh, a copy of the report itself, just in case you did fancy doing a bit of further reading at some point. There we go. So we've got that there. And I will now attempt to share my screen so I can take you through how Octopus fits together in practice. Right, that looks promising. Yeah. Brilliant. So here we are on um, the Octopus platform itself, and there's probably a few things that you immediately notice about uh, about the page you can see here and these sort of tiles we got. I'm not going to talk about those tiles immediately because I think there's a, a quick point of note that I should make before we dive into that, which is uh, about these titles that we can see up at the top here. So Alex has already taken you through um, how those fit together very loosely. And um, you can see a similar sort of structure here where we start with a research problem, we move through into a hypothesis, a method, results, and so on. Um, and the thing that may stick out here for some of you is that those are obviously fairly STEM orientated uh, terms. And I think it's, it's a crucial point to make here is these are the terms we are using to describe those steps, but that isn't necessarily to say that the platform is designed for STEM specifically. It has come from a somewhat STEM orientated background with Alex, of course, being uh, a STEM researcher, but it's not intended to be restricted to that. Um, so I guess a, a principle behind the design of the platform is this idea that all research or primary research is a series of steps that are somewhat universal, these fundamental stages in the process of inquiry and finding something out ultimately. Um, and so what helps me certainly to think about uh, these publications in the context of other disciplines is to think of them as questions. So we could think, for instance, of the research problem as what, uh, what is the gap in the knowledge? The hypothesis could be what are we going to find? You know, what do we expect? The method is how will we excuse me, how will we find it? The results are what did we find? The analysis is what can we derive from that? And so on. And thinking about it in that sense perhaps makes it uh, a little bit easier to map this sort of structure here onto something other than STEM. So maybe that's uh, something to bear in mind as I go through. 
Uh, onto those nice tiles that I mentioned. Um, each of these is in fact a publication in its own right. Um, so here we are on the page for a hypothesis and you can see next to it, it's been taken out into two separate methods to investigate that hypothesis. Each one's had results gathered for it. Those results have been analyzed and then brought back together into a single interpretation. So we've got two different strands that this research project has been taken in. Uh, one that is for testing the hypothesis via online surveys and another for qualitative interviews. Um, and no points for guessing who A. Freeman is on a lot of these. Um, that means I do happen to know that in this case, the team that worked on this, um, it was a single team that provided both of those different uh, strands. They had a qualitative team and a quantitative team, but it doesn't have to be that way necessarily. So Alex mentioned about this, this idea of instead of building a tall tower, you're sort of sitting there on a wider foundation with other people putting their own bricks in as well. And that's um, quite a nice example that we can theorize about here where uh, another researcher comes in who's just reading this publication, just having a look at the hypothesis. They have a look at the methods and they think perhaps there's another way to test this hypothesis that I think would be interesting. And they would actually be able to bolt that uh, method as a new publication with its own DOI um, onto the back of the hypothesis, obviously giving credit to that hypothesis as the place it's derived from, but taking it out into a new direction. Um, and then that could have its own results built on the back of it and so on um, out into its own thread of research or equally it could be tied together into a single interpretation as we've had here. So someone could come along and sort of tie those threads back together. Um, there are a lot of different ways of working that I think this enables, some of which are perhaps um, more of a change from how we're used to working now, whilst others are a bit closer to it. So uh, one that I always really like to talk about is one that Alex just mentioned about the file draw hypothesis. Um, so this is where you can just um, put something fairly quick on the platform. Uh, if we look at the research problem, actually, it really is a fairly small piece. As I said, this is just the gap in the knowledge. So it's really just spelling out what the question is. And that doesn't necessarily take a lot of investment in terms of time. And it's the sort of thing that I think a lot of people will have a question that they may not get around to. Perhaps it's not their area of expertise. Perhaps they're too busy to investigate it. But with Octopus, uh, you have a place where you can publish that. You can get a DIY on it. Um, you can get credit for it and you can leave it up there for someone else to potentially come along and build on the back of um, like this with sort of further stages in the research process. Uh, so there's a sort of a yin and a yang of these two different ways of working that complement each other there where people go on the platform and put up research problems um, that they think they won't get around to and other people can use the platform as a place to discover new things to research. Maybe there's an interesting question they stumble across. Uh, we've actually seeded the platform with about 7,000 of these research problems uh, so that people can use it as a place to discover new things to research. Uh, so that hopefully that's of, of interest to people. Uh, another way of working I always like to talk about here is uh, a sort of nomadic data analyst. Um, so we can see over here that we've had uh, a couple of analyses performed, one for each of these uh, sets of results. But let's say that I'm having a read of uh, A. Lawrence's analysis of the interviews over here, or perhaps uh, maybe a, a quantitative uh, example is better of these uh, Giraccia's survey analysis here. And I see the analysis they've done. I think this is very interesting, but there's actually a particular analytical technique that I'm I quite know quite a lot about, I'm quite good at it, uh, that hasn't been applied here and that I think would yield something interesting. All I would need to do is go over to the results publication here and I could just attach my analysis onto the back of this publication um, to take it out and get into a new direction. Um, you can do this fairly easily. We have this series of options down here and all I would need to do as a reader is hit this option to write a linked analysis and that will get me started on publishing this sort of next step, this extra thread on this uh, this network of research that we've got going on here. Uh, we'll come back to some more of these options in just a moment, uh, but I think there are a few other sort of general points <clears throat> about the platform that are quite good to make. Uh, Alex mentioned that we don't have any barriers to publishing, uh, and I think that's uh, very absolute as far as we're concerned. We've tried to make it as, uh, as easy and straightforward to publish as possible. So the big one is there aren't and never will be any fees to publish or to read anything on the platform. It's all completely open. Um, we, the only barrier we do have is uh, creating an ORCID profile. So if you have an ORCID, um, you use that to log in. That's how we, we authenticate our accounts. And you can see down here that each of our authors on this publication and on all publications are associated with their ORCID ID. Um, that makes it quite nice for us as well in terms of accountability and sort of tracking, because if I go on to uh, A. Freeman's uh, profile here, we can get a bit of information from their ORCID profile. We can actually link, uh, navigate straight to that if we want to. We can see their works. And down here at the bottom, we can see their ORCID publications, uh, sorry, their Octopus publications as well. So we've got this kind of central area to keep an eye on everything that this author is doing. 
Uh, going back over to the publication page, this gets a little bit more relevant here because I'm going to talk about some of the uh, feedback mechanisms that we have. So next to our option to write a linked analysis, we also have these options to write a review and to flag a concern with this publication. Um, peer reviews, as Alex has mentioned, are very granular on here, so they're quite specialised. They specifically relate to the single publication that you're looking at. So, for instance, a peer review of the analysis would be just that. It is just analysing uh, sorry, just reviewing the analysis without having to worry about anything that's gone on at other stages of that research project, which makes it um, hopefully shorter and sort of a little bit less effort to write, but also much more specialised. So as a data analyst, um, there are things that you could review quite comfortably because you're just reviewing the data analysis. Uh, so hopefully that's a bit of an incentive for people. Um, and alongside that, we have this option to flag a concern. Again, as we don't have uh, any barriers really to publishing, it is possible that you end up seeing some stuff on the platform that's been put on there with certain issues in it. And so this just allows you to flag those issues essentially. So I can hit this option down here on the bottom right that I've just opened. Um, and you can see I can select from various issues, ethical issues, plagiarism, copyright, things like that. And I can just type in a little bit of detail about exactly what it is that I'm raising a concern about. And this will do a few things once I hit that submit button there. It will raise it against the publication so everyone can see that there's an active red flag. It will raise it against the profile of the uh, person who's raised it. So you can see here everything that people have done um, in terms of rating feedback, peer reviews and red flags both show up on their profile. So we can sort of track how people are interacting um, to make sure things are being done responsibly. And finally, raising this red flag will also uh, open a dialogue between myself and the authors of this publication so we can discuss that concern and hopefully come to a resolution. Uh, one other option that we have in here is this option to write a linked research problem. So I've talked a little bit about different ways of working with sort of bolting publications onto the back of an existing um, set of research or onto existing other publications. Um, and that's all well and good in the context of continuing this chain. So for instance, um, if I'm looking at this um, hypothesis and I want to publish a new method or something like that, I can add that in and that provides a copy of the next step in the process. But what if I want to take this out in a completely new direction? What if I'm having a look at this analysis? And I think actually there's a question that's being posed here that isn't really being addressed directly by the authors, or perhaps I as an author have identified it and just want to draw attention to it. Either way, all I need to do is hit this option down here to write a linked research problem, and that will create a new copy, uh, a new instance of this sort of first stage publication in its own chain of research. So I'm sort of saying, well, within this analysis, there is something that's worthy of its own its own research process, and I can start off that new chain from there, and I or someone else can then build upon that to, to grow that out into its own avenue of inquiry. Um, a few other things to note on here. So I talked a little bit about the, um, the feedback mechanisms that we do have in place. There is a third form of feedback um, that we're going to be building for the platform. We haven't yet because I think it needs to be worked on very carefully. Uh, but this is something that because we've split the, um, I suppose, the concept of a research paper into these smaller, more granular components, each of which represents a, a fundamental stage of the research process, it gives us an opportunity to perhaps assess them in a slightly different way to how you might in a traditional paper. Uh, so the idea behind this is that uh, whereas other platforms will use uh, impact and things like that and sort of metrics for impact to track um, a publication, we want to stay away from impact. That's the job of the journals and that's something that we're leaving them to do whilst we're trying to be the place uh, where quality is the primary focus. And therefore it makes a lot of sense for us to have a metric that we can use to define quality on our platform. Again, agnostic of impact and popularity and so on. Um, and the way we envisage doing that is by defining a few key criteria for each publication type um, that we would work with the community to make sure we've got the right sort of terms and that they're, um, they're a good way to encompass the definition of quality for that type of publication. Uh, so for instance, for an analysis, it could be that the data is well annotated, that it's of sufficient size to test the hypothesis, and perhaps that it's fully available or non-derivative or something like that. We would then provide those three metrics uh, on the page so that they could be scored on a one to five or a one to 10 scale, something like that. And then that over time, as enough people um, view that publication and score it, would build up an idea of the average um, the sort of reader's perception of the quality of that publication, which can be useful both for another passing reader to have a look at how this is being received by the rest of the community, and also as a way to feed back to authors and give them a bit of an insight into how people view their publication and their work so far. 
Um, so hopefully that's going to be quite a useful one for people and quite an interesting one. But it is something we have to approach very carefully. So we're working with various um, sort of research assessment experts um, to try and come up with the right plan for this. And then we'll be taking it out to the community through surveys and workshops to make sure that we actually get this right, because obviously introducing a new form of research assessment isn't something we should take lightly. Um, so that's one to look out for. Um, and on the back of all of these uh, research assessment options that we have, we want to make sure that the platform is also a place where you can refine your work so that it, it remains of high quality and can be improved into a higher quality uh, in line with the feedback you've received. And so the other feature that we're building that we're working on at the moment, actually, that hopefully should be released fairly shortly is our reversioning system that Alex mentioned uh, during her presentation. And this one's much simpler in concept. This is just the idea that you can take your existing publication and you can publish a new version of it. That version wouldn't sort of bury the old one. We'd give people a way to choose which version they're viewing. Um, but it means that in line with any feedback you've received, you can um, you can publish a new version that takes that feedback into account. Um, so hopefully that's something people will find useful as they go through the platform, getting all of these uh, new forms of feedback. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to go through on the sort of main publication page itself. Uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to raise there, Alex, I think we'll switch over yeah, to taking a quick look at publishing. Yeah, about um, removing bias because um, the platform's very much designed to help people assess the intrinsic quality of work and try not to be biased by things like popularity, sexiness of topic or impact. But we also are very aware of other potential sources of bias. So you'll notice that we don't put any first names on the site. So you don't know gender and we don't put the institutions there. I mean, obviously, if you click through to an author's page, you can find out all of this information. But when you're looking at a publication, we're trying to strip back any uh, of the major cues that we can to try and remove sources of potential bias in assessment. So, yeah. That's all I wanted yeah. to add. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so what I'll do before we um, before we move directly into the publishing process is we'll just go through the scenario of what I'm going to be uh, pretending I'm publishing today because I won't actually be hitting publish um, during this, uh, this oh, session. Oh, you're not. I thought you were going no, to. No, I was going to, but then I realised I'll have to show people's email addresses if we go through the co-authors process. Um, uh, I see. So I'll, I'll switch at that point. Um, so here we have. Should, um, should leave, we've got to leave enough room for questions. So. Yes, I'll try and I'll try and get through this fairly quickly. Um, so here we have the um, Octopus publications for the report that Alex has been talking about. We also have it in a sort of full PDF form, but it's available in the system as a series of publications too. Um, and what we're going to be doing is looking at publishing the next stage, so the real world applications of this report. Um, so to do this, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process. I just need to come down here and hit write a linked uh, real world application. Uh, here's one I've made earlier. Uh, where I've already clicked that button and filled out a few details. And I'll just take you through the sort of information to put in. Um, so we've got our title up here, fairly straightforward. Um, all of our publications have a CC by four license, so they're an open access license. Um, next up, we have our affiliations. This is, is fairly straightforward. We pull these in from your ORCID profile, so you don't need to go through re-entering data. We just bring that down. Um, and I'll e either need to add an affiliation or select that I'm an independent author. If I do choose to add an affiliation, then this will tell integrations we have, like with Publications Router, that this can be sent on to their institutional repositories. Um, so I've entered in JISC here, so we know that I'm uh, publishing this under my capacity uh, with JISC and obviously with support from JISC. Next up, we need to um, find something to link it to. This is because I didn't actually click the button I was demoing. Uh, I should have done that. But we'll be linking this to um, that interpretation. So I will just search in this field for the title. And we can see it here, so I select that and hit add link. And as you may have inferred from the um, publications you've seen so far, everything on Octopus does have to be linked from something else. So if you can't find a publication to relate it to directly, we do also have research topics, which is uh, essentially the Library of Congress classification outline. So I can, for instance, look in here and have a look through social sciences to find the thing I want to link it to um, if I would like to do so. Obviously, for this, we do have a publication to link to, so that's fine. Next up, we have our main text, fairly straightforward. It's a text editor. You can import from Word as well if you want to. Uh, and then we have our references. This publication doesn't actually have any references, um, but I will just quickly do a couple as an example. So let's imagine that I've pasted these in from, you know, a Word document or something like that. Perhaps I'm post printing things in and I've got a whole list of 20 of these. All I need to do is paste it into this box and hit add and it will strip them out into separate line items. Um, and strip the DOI out so we have some nice metadata about exactly what it is you're referring to, and also so that you can edit these individually if you wanted to. 
We also have our conflict of interest statement just up here. Um, so you know, obviously to declare any conflict of interest you may have. For other types of publication, you might have a bit more detail to put into uh, certain fields in this sort of declarations area. So ethical statements, um, data processing statements and things like that. Pre-registration statements is another one that we uh, we do. Depending on the type of publication you're making, there'll be a few things to declare or to uh, um, to disclose with a few checkboxes and things like that. But I don't think there's anything too complicated happening there. Next, we have funding information um, so that we can um, see what sort of funding you've received for your project and also so those funders can see um, the work that they've been funding. We allow you to enter either the raw ID of your funder or enter their details manually. Um, and I won't go onto the co-authors tab. I will go onto the test site and show you something similar because otherwise you'll see some people's emails. Um, so it's the final step because each account on Octopus is linked to an ORCID profile. We want to make sure that each uh, author on on your publication has a chance to consent to the thing you're publishing in their name. And so for that reason, um, if I add in another author via their email, this is the email for my accomplice here. You can see that this button up here at the top that previously said publish now says request approval. And the final step for me is to hit this option here to send a request over the, to them to them for them to approve it. Um, they'll then be asked to you know to take a quick look at it, make sure they're happy with it, enter their affiliations. And then finally, I can hop back into the system and hit publish once they've given it the thumbs up. Um, and that's all there is to it. So hopefully a fairly uh, straightforward process, just a few a few sort of key steps, a few places where maybe there's a slight snag with um, sort of linking to another publication and things like that that some people may not be so familiar with, um, but hopefully relatively straightforward. And I think I will stop talking there so I don't eat up all of our Q&A time. Thanks, Tim. Thank you both very much. That was really helpful. Really good to see both sides of the kind of picture with the motivations and purpose behind it and the practical side. Um, we have got quite a lot of questions come through in the Q&A, um, so I'll pick out some of those now. And if we don't have time to answer all of them, um, maybe we can email them over to you both um, and send them round, send answers round with the recording, if that's OK with you. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'll start with the most recent question just because it relates directly to what you were just demonstrating, Tim. Um, so a question here, you mentioned hiding affiliation information to mitigate the risk of bias in review. For the purposes of accurate documentation and analysis, it's often useful to know a person's affiliation for a given output, but obviously a person's affiliation may change over time. If affiliation is only given on Octopus through the author profile, how do you clarify which affiliation a person had at the point when they produced a specific output? So there are a couple of things you can do to uh, dig out affiliations. Um, even from here, we sort of try and keep them a little bit out of the way, but you can get to them. Um, if you're feeling particularly technical, you can go and look in the metadata of the publication, either via its DOI record or um, via this sort of JSON download that we give you here. Or you can actually open up the PDF of these publications and it will list uh, the affiliations in there. Um, it just has to generate this for me, but there you go. Uh, so here we have our list of the two affiliations that this publication has. And up at the top along the list of authors, you can see they're annotated with these superscript ones and twos to represent each uh, each affiliation that they've entered. Yeah, so the PDF essentially acts a bit like a traditional paper if um, if you need that format. Um, and as Tim showed, you you do choose your affiliation per publication and you can have multiple affiliations for the publication too. Great, thank you. Um, hope that answers the question, George. Um, so there's a couple of questions around research assessment, which I know you did um, talk about as well. So um, there's one question around how do you associate Octopus publications with the REF? Very good question. <laughs> um, so the next ref, obviously, we're still um, still in negotiation how it's all going to work. I mean, obviously, uh, by choosing your institutional affiliation, you get to know, um, you know, your institution will know what uh, what you've published. And we know that the next ref is encouraging uh, a broader range of research outputs to be submitted and assessed as part of ref. Um, because we're Research England funded, hopefully that means that we're top of their minds when they're talking about REF and how to submit. And as I said, we are trying to integrate as much with um, existing institutional systems. So we're trying to make it easy 
for um, Octopus publications to be submitted to the REF. But we don't know how the next REF is going to work at all at the moment. So, yeah, that's all TBC. I guess kind of on the flip side to that, we've got uh, a different question on this. Uh, Holly's asked, in the UK in particular, there's an incredible fixation on the REF and star ratings mm -hmm. and impact, as you've already alluded to. And she says, Alex, do you think Octopus can influence research assessment exercises and help break away from a fixation on traditional publication? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And we are talking to um, institutions and funders about how to help change that system. Um, you know, there are good reasons why impact is important, but there's very good reasons why quality is important as well. And uh, research assessment needs to recognise both of those components. So, yeah, we're trying to talk to all of the people that we need to talk to, um, certainly within the UK. You know, the rest of the world is also important, uh, but quite difficult for us to reach all of them. But um, if you're on this call and you have contacts that we should be talking to, then absolutely drop us a line. Perfect. Thank you. Um, also had a couple of questions around peer review. Um, so one question is just simply who does the peer review? Well, anybody. So any reader can write a peer review. Um, as I said, it's like a publication. So it'll appear on your author page when you've written one, like any other kind of publication. Um, and so, I mean, this has, it does change what we think of as peer review. So it's not, you'll be able to click through and see who a peer reviewer is. So if you're concerned that they don't have the expertise they need to write the review of your publication, you'll be able to see that. But those quality metrics that Tim was talking about will equally apply to peer reviews. So peer reviews will be judged on predefined criteria of what makes a good peer review. And so hopefully, this new openness about it will mean that we can all learn what good peer reviewing looks like and you can get credit for doing good peer reviewing. But the simple answer to the question is anybody can peer review anything. I think, you know, I think you've, you've kind of just alluded to this, but another question on peer review is if research assessment should be moving towards peer review and away from metrics, what are the best ways to incentivise peer review of octopus objects? Yeah, I mean, I think the the main thing that we all know people get uh, assessed on is their publication. So treating peer reviews like a publication is kind of stage one to that. And then because we're trying to make it not just quantity of publications that people are assessed on, adding the quality metrics on top of that, I hope, will mean that it's being incentivized, just like we're all incentivized to publish at the moment. Thank you. I think we've just got time for one more question. Um, so we had a question, it's quite a long one, so I'll try my best to read it out clearly. Um, so John White says, I agree that getting the research out there is more important than presenting it, but is this idea ultimately at odds with the concept of open science? I.e. if the findings are not clear and accessible to all, then most people would not be able to read and understand them. Does this then increase the risk of misinformation with bad actors who I do understand, who do understand what they're reading, purposefully misinterpreting articles to support their cause? This already happens, but the open availability of research and the culture was ongoing do increase the risks. Yeah, this is um this is a quite a broad point about open science and open research. Um, and I don't think that the answer to uh, concerns about bad actors is closing down research even more. I think opening up research has to be valuable. Um, Octopus is not designed to be a good read. It's designed to be a geeky place that geeks go to. But it's also, you know, it's not going to be your first go to point as a journalist or as a member of the public. But I completely accept that there are bad actors who will go to it because it's free and easy to read. However, stuff isn't just put in there in a vacuum. I think the fact that it's set within theories and research problems and with peer reviews means that there is important context to what's put in Octopus that is perhaps missing in the journals. So if there is a publication which could be misinterpreted uh, and misrepresented, then the reviews of that publication and the context of that publication can be pulled 
into uh, the public domain by other people who want to write about how this has been misrepresented or how this has been misinterpreted. So it, it is a long and complex question that we could talk about for a very long time. But I think um, transparency and openness are a good thing as long as they are done intelligently, allowing accessibility and allowing context to be seen and to be discussed. Thank you. I think that's a really. Uh, oh, Holly's just messaged me saying maybe we should see if uh, people can stay on a bit longer. Um, Alex and Tim. I'm are you very happy to, to carry ask? on chatting, and people yeah, can likewise. leave if they want. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll carry on with some more questions then. Obviously, if anyone needs to leave, we'll keep going with the recording, and you will be sent it um, afterwards. Um, okay. Perfect. So. Um, I was just going to follow up actually on what you were just saying with one of my questions before we go on to the others. Um, just to kind of thinking really, if Octopus is this geeky place for geeks to go and read about research, um, if we imagine a world where everyone was doing that, do you think that then makes the role of the journal article more important in communicating research to a non-expert audience? That yeah. kind of becomes the purpose Absolutely. of the journal article. Absolutely. And I mean, when you say non-expert, I think there are huge degrees of, it's a huge spectrum of expertise so you know the sort of person who's actually going to be looking at the ana analytical code for a particular uh, piece of research is really small probably um, but the people who might be interested in knowing you know the the general context of that is bigger the people who want to know about the findings of that will be even bigger and so there's I think this we need this spectrum of communication platforms to match the spectrum of different audiences so right from the you know we at octopus are the most geeky end to you know the tabloid press and social media are at the most broad end and then everywhere in between that the journals um there are more generalist journals of the sort of the nature and science variety there are the more specialist journals who are you know, one step geekier than that. And then, you know, there's the kind of Scientific Americans, New Scientists, New York Times, you know, there's the whole spectrum. And so what I think we're missing is the organised geeky end, because at the moment, all the really detailed stuff is spread across repositories and, and, um, and uh, you know, specialist sites, and they're not being recognised by people who give credit for... Um, uh, researchers and so it's really pulling it into being more useful being more accessible and being something you can get credit for yeah no i think that's a really good point really interesting way to think about the whole research process really um so the the very first question we had in uh this afternoon was are the academics not worried about sharing their ideas early on and getting the ideas kind of uh, stolen which i think you did uh, mention but i didn't know if you wanted to say a bit more on that yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, people are. Um, and uh, we found from the survey that, as you saw, that that is, you know, the top worry about sharing stuff early. And yet, one of the first things that comes out is that almost everybody who was interviewed wants to be able to share early because they can see the benefits. So that's the real um, tension, I think, between people seeing the benefits of sharing early, but being afraid of scooping. And the way I think to remove that, as I said, is to remove the fact that at the moment you mainly get credit for the findings. So the scooping worry is about people uh, getting credit bef uh, for work that is uh, sort of, uh, you know, you're not at the stage where you get credit. If you're going along a track and you only get credit when you get two thirds of the way or all the way down the track, we need to make sure that people get credit for each station along that railway. So it's that's one of the major um, features of octopus and hopefully that then removes the problem of scooping and by removing that one problem you allow people you free people up to do that sharing earlier which everybody seems to agree would be a useful thing to do yeah perfect thank you um, another question we had is what happens in the case of a stalemate where an academic or expert might disagree I guess that's around red flagging, um, probably. Uh, and so uh, the conversation that Tim showed you is all open. So when you respond to a per or somebody raises a flag, then
then you respond. All of that's visible to other readers. If, um, and we haven't set this yet, but what we're going to do probably is set a uh, maybe a time limit on that. So if it's been going on for six months or a year or whatever without resolution, that red flag is still up. All of that time, it's all useful because people can still read the article. They can still read the red flag conversation. So people are still getting the information. But ideally, you don't want this ongoing dispute. So then it would um, go to a research integrity office. And now in the UK, that's fairly easy to do because institutions and there is a national um, uh, UK Rio um, so there are mechanisms to uh, sort out these kinds of disputes, but internationally, that's a bigger problem um, because there isn't always an institutional uh, research integrity office. So it's a system that we'd like to automate. But at the moment, what we say is if you as the person who's raised a red flag don't feel you've had um, resolution, here are places you can go to to find an appropriate research integrity office who will independently help resolve that dispute. But those are for real red flag disputes. I mean, obviously, there are ongoing discussions in the scientific arena. And Octopus isn't designed to be a social media site. So if you if you just, you know, if you have a peer review, so you think that there's something that is uh, not taken into account of in an interpretation or in an analysis, write a peer review and, and raise that question. If you just disagree, then you know go and do your own research and create your it's, own it's, parallel strand it's part of the reason why we have those categories on red flags because each of them hopefully is something that's relatively unambiguous you know if there's a copyright infringement that's a, a relatively binary situation misrepresentation things like that ethical issues they're all things that generally i mean there could there is some room for negotiation and discussion but generally it's uh, there is or there isn't type of situation so hopefully we wouldn't get loads of those uh, sitting there unresolved yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. And I think one final question then um, we have, does anything prevent an inappropriate or incorrect peer review from being seen on screen with your work? For example, common website comments and issues surrounding. So Tim, our peer reviews say. don't actually sit uh, visually directly against it, so you wouldn't be able to see it on the same screen. Um, we have a kind of a subheading and then we'll list out all of the peer reviews you've received that's down towards um, the bottom of the page. Um, those peer reviews are then subject to the same quality uh, feedback mechanisms that normal publications are subject to. So because it is a publication in its own right on Octopus, um, it can also be red flagged. It can also be uh, sort of quality scored and things like that. So the hope is that if a particularly unqualified or scathing peer review comes out that perhaps shouldn't be so scathing, that in itself would reflect badly on the author of that peer review and in particular that in itself would be something that readers could discern so a reader visits this peer review sees that it's very critical but they also see there's a red flag against it they also see that it's got perhaps a low quality scoring in a particular area um, and then they can form their own judgment about it um, so hopefully that will mean that it's not quite it's not quite such a bad thing to just have a negative peer review because that negative peer review in itself needs to prove its own credibility to be taken seriously Thank you. That's really clear. Um, this really is the last question this time because it is just a really quick one. Someone's just put in the chat. Um, what's the average turnaround time to be published? And I think that is just immediate. It yeah. is. Five yeah. minutes, maybe? It depends how long it takes you to type. <laughs> I would yeah. say less than five minutes, but it does depend on your co-authors. Uh, uh, over the last couple of days, we've been chasing uh, co-authors and so uh, with publications because Tim and I have been publishing the uh, the research um, into research culture and uh, yeah so sometimes you have to ping your co-authors but there is actually a button for chase your co-authors so uh, <laughs> automate it. yeah perfect thank you thank you very much um thank you so much tim and alex for coming on today and uh discussing this all with us i think you can tell from the amount of questions we've had that everyone's been really engaged with learning more about octopus so it's been really helpful um thank you to everyone who's come along today um, and engaged with us on this. And thanks to everyone who's joined us throughout the whole of our open access week. Holly, I don't know.